we've got a flood of pretty decent FPS mouse releases in the back half of 2022. So today I want to talk about the five or six that have been living on my desk and a couple that didn't quite make the cut. All these mice today are wireless. They're all lightweight. They're all medium or smaller. They're almost all symmetrical and they're all good. All of them. Like you really can't go wrong with anything on today's list, though some are packing better tech and more optimized firmware than others. I guess we'll start with the Atlantis because with Lamzu being such a new company, this was a pretty solid release. The biggest thing for me is that this is the closest you can get to a wireless XM1 at the time of this video. Endgame has one of the best shapes for me with the XM1, but their road to wireless has been filled with hurdles, and that's given the opportunity for somebody like Lamzu to capitalize on that. It's not an exact clone, but it's pretty damn close. The hump is more centered, it doesn't flare out quite as much at the front, and there are slight comfort grooves here versus the XM1, but to me, these feel pretty similar in hand. This weighs right about 55 grams with a solid shell and a skeletal bottom plate that looks pretty sick regardless of which colorway you go with. This is a medium-sized claw grip mouse with a front trigger height of 13 millimeters. I found this front height measurement to be a pretty good indicator of how well I'm going to play with the mouse. We have Huano 80 mil switches in here. These are very light, very spammable. It's got a 3395 sensor with the Compact MCU, so it shares a processor and likely the majority of the firmware with like the Pulsar X2. So it more than likely has the same slightly higher click latency, but I'm still in the process of cataloging all the latency specs for all my mice on the test system. This charges over USB-C with about 70 hours of battery life, but one of the best things about the Atlantis is the price. In a world where flagships are fetching $150 or more, this is $89.99 most places, and it's in stock, which is something you love to see when you're looking at mice that you can't just run out and grab at a Best Buy, unlike larger brands like Razer or Logitech. It does include a couple sets of extra skates, no grips, and it does have pretty elaborate packaging that a lot of people celebrate for being premium, but I prefer the move to more minimal, eco-friendly packaging that we're starting to see more of. This is a mouse I go back to a lot, and it's an easy recommend, provided you have at least a medium size hand. Mine measures 20.5 by 10.5 centimeters, and I did see that they have a mini version of this mouse that should be shipping pretty soon. Next up, the Starlight 10s from Final Mouse. This mouse is the literal opposite of being affordable and easy to acquire. It seems like they always sell out quickly and find their way to secondary sellers, but this one was actually in stock for a few hours and pretty low stress if you were trying to cop. Despite having a Twitter account that people love to hate, you really can't argue that Final Mouse innovates and moves the industry forward. They were the first company to popularize lightweight shells with holes, and they were the first to market with an ultralight magnesium alloy shell. This not only broke the weight barrier, coming in as low as 47 grams for the medium frame and 42 for the small, but they started getting copies in people's hands in summer of 21, and no one in the industry has been able to successfully copy this yet, though we are starting to see some pretty embarrassing attempts. So the tens represents almost the final version of this design, and it retailed for $189.99. The last legend is the official final copy, but they haven't started shipping those just yet. Each release has seen slight revisions and adjustments for QC, and the tens has been the best of the revisions so far. Aesthetically, it's also arguably the cleanest looking release until the last legend. I have seen that mouse in person, and even though it's mostly just a simple color flip, it is, for me, the best looking Starlight so far. One major thing this time around is that the Infinity skins are back from the Cape Town. These not only add grip, but they can vary the width of the mouse a little or a lot, depending on what's comfortable for you. These have KL 8.0 switches and their own final sensor, which pulls at 1000 hertz. About the only thing people still slight this mouse on is the continued use of micro USB charging, which you'll have on the desk anyway, as this uses a flat receiver as opposed to a dongle. Battery life here is also very good. You can use this thing daily and you'll charge it probably once every three weeks. Supposedly, the last legend is the last of this design, so it'll be very interesting to see where Final Mouse goes from here. If you're curious, the pad I've been using primarily is the Saturn Pro from Lethal Gaming Gear. I've been using it pretty much since it arrived and it replaced the Saturn before it. This is basically an Artisan Zero, which is very high praise and it's just a nice, consistent cloth pad. It's an easy recommend. The only thing with the dimensions is that it's a large square, so make sure you've got clearance with your monitor stand first. I've also recently been handed a pad that was developed by a YouTuber named Patty Cakes. He is primarily a Destiny 2 player, but it's proficient anywhere you need to click heads. This is called the Ember Edge. This thing rolled out flat instantly. I like the dimensions of it being super wide by standard height. It's a non-coated cloth surface that plays a little faster than the Saturn Pro. This is currently in pre-sale, looking at a March release. This is probably going to be one of those pads nobody believes me about because nobody's heard of it, so I'm going to encourage him to get this pad in the hands of some of the other mouse reviewers out there. Next up is the Viper V2 Pro from Razer. This mouse rubbed a lot of people the wrong way for its price point at $149.99 and its stripped back feature set, while the Death Adder V3, which is not a Death Adder at all, topped a lot of people's list for mouse of the year. Alert! Oval 
Take me to Boardsy's video. Yo, what's good, Bad Seeds channel? It's Boardsy, and I was asked to pick one of my favorite mice of the year, getting right into it, the Victor Wembenyama of gaming mice, the Death Adder V3 Pro. <laughs> it's hard to argue that this is not the most premium mouse released this year. In terms of wireless tech and click latency, Razer is at the top of the game. That applies to the Viper V2 Pro as well, but the Viper Ultimate shape is just not as good as this updated Death Adder shape. Um, they made the shape flare out a lot less at the front, and in general, it just feels a lot more like a Zowie EC2 or an EC1 than the old Death Adder. Another massive change that was made was a weight reduction, getting it down to 63 grams. So having a large ergo shape in the low 60s, premium in terms of quality, all of the switches, side buttons are nice. It's just the mouse to beat right now in my opinion if you have large hands and play either claw or palm grip it's kind of just like the g pro super light in that you can recommend it and there's no way you're not going to enjoy it if you do have smaller hands maybe wait for a mini version but yeah death adder v3 pro such a based mouse honestly it's more than based i'd go as far as to call it a stupendous mouse with 4k hertz pulling rate um it's just crazy it is a crazy mouse um but yeah peace a lot of people are a fan of that refreshed death adder shape but purely subjective i just play better with the viper ultimate shape let's talk about the 4k wireless too because so far razor and g wolves are the only ones to market with 4000 pulling hertz wireless and that razor dongle has been very tough to get the big question with 4k is does this make me better at games and the answer is no, it does feel smoother. Definitely when you're playing on a high refresh panel and you've got a rig that can keep you over that 240 FPS mark, but that smoothness is more of like a visual effect for me. In combination with the fast panel, it alone doesn't see me performing any better in game. You know how when you got your first high refresh panel and you couldn't tell immediately that it was a lot smoother until you went back to your older panel and then it was really obvious? That's not even the case here. I can play all day on the 4K dongle, then go back to 1000 Hz pulling rate. I don't notice any difference in performance in game. It also comes at a massive hit to battery life. Nonetheless, when I do use this mouse, I do play on the 4K just because I like the way it feels on my high refresh panel. Pulsar is another company that's managed to make some noise this year with the X2 releases. These retail for $94.95 for the standard versions and $119.95 for the recently launched Bruce Lee limited edition. There is crazy detail in this one from the printing on the dongle, the graphics on the PCB, the color matching on the cable and the extender. It's got some stickers, an authenticity card, extra PTFE skates, and includes some of their Super Glide glass skates with the same colorway and branding. I understand the early versions of this mouse had some QC stuff going on, but I've been playing for a couple weeks now with the Bruce Lee and I'm really enjoying it. Despite a little post travel on both triggers and side play on mouse two, I never noticed this in game. I have not, however, been playing with this. This is a very limited 100 piece friends and family colorway of the Bruce Lee that arrived to me in this Pelican hard case and it is absolutely gorgeous. This this will live on a display shelf somewhere in the studio. I really like the shape of this mouse for claw grip. It lands somewhere between like the old Davina S2 and the G Pro Superlight. That G Pro shape is so safe that I never managed to find a consistent grip that worked for me. And in comparison, we've got the hump push more towards the rear, we've got a lower front height at 12 millimeters with those slight comfort grooves again. We also have a much more defined hourglass shape than the G Pro. This weighs in here right at 59 grams. This Bruce Lee version sees a move to optical switches, which are made in the same factory as Razer and they feel and sound very similar. I have heard some feedback that these are a big improvement over the Kale 8.0 implementation that they had in some of their older models. We also get a new coating here that's grippier, which is definitely appreciated versus those older runs. This has the same sensor and processor as the Lamzu Atlantis, and the performance here in game is very solid. They've also announced some pretty exciting stuff for 2023, including some truly ambidextrous models and a new version of this shape that has like a Brazilian hump lift, which I'll be anxious to get my hands on. But for me, a mouse shape doesn't get much better than this. I'll be anxiously awaiting my Boardsy edition. Also, also blowing up this year and igniting interest in a lot of different mouse shapes is g Wolves, who have had some actually fire releases lately. I'm sorry. This little guy right here is the HSK Plus. It goes for about 109 bucks. This is probably the closest I'll get to something like the Zound Koenig MK2. This is wireless. This version has a 3370 and it is small, small. Weighs in at 41 grams with the stock skates and it really is a fingertip mouse. Again, with the comfort grooves and the low front height, this thing is a blast in an aim trainer. It is decent in game too, as long as you don't depend too much on your side buttons. If you wanna get totally dialed into just one grip, which you do, I find that I can reliably only hit one side button or the other depending 
depending on how I'm holding the mouse. If I try to use both, I have to reposition my grip slightly. It's too much to think about when I'm in the middle of a match. I also wish the scroll wheel was just a little easier to depress. So it's a really fun mouse, but it's not super functional for the way I play. There's also a 4K version of this and an even smaller version if this is taking up too much room on your desk. It was pretty tough to review and recommend G-Wolves mice in 2022 because the batches they released were extremely small. They were really erratic in terms of timing, just generally hard to get your hands on. Now you'll find a lot of their stuff in stock at Max Gaming and a handful of models have made it to Amazon US if you don't want to buy direct from G-Wolves. I have also spent some time with the HTS Plus 4K. It's a pretty solid shape. It feels good in game. I'm not a huge fan of the coding at all and the trigger has suffered some pretty pronounced side play. Still charges with micro USB for some reason and in the weirdest thing ever, you have to use an included stick to turn this mouse on and off. To me, this is a mouse that has promise, but it feels like a prototype, not a polished product. And as such, even with the 4K polling, I have a really hard time with that $159 to $169 price point. All right, this is the MZ1 Wireless from ExtraFi. This was designed by Rocket Jump Ninja. And when I first reviewed the wired version way back, I thought this was simply too small for me. But I have since spent a ton of time with this wireless version. This retails for 120 US and it weighs in at 62 grams, which shockingly makes it the heaviest mouse on today's list. We've got a 3370 sensor and KLGM 8.0 switches. The implementation here feels very good, really light, very spammable. This also has the ability to adjust the weight balance of the mouse from front to back, which I've never done. And it includes an additional rear shell if you want to flatten the shape out a little bit more. But personally, I like it a little more caked up. It gives me a place to rest my palm. This is yet another mouse with a low front height at just about 12 millimeters really makes it for me. Coupled with the deep comfort grooves on these triggers, this provides a ton of control for me in claw grip. Full disclosure, this shape is not for everybody. Like it's not a very safe recommend, but it works great for me. Disable the RGB on this thing and you get about 70 to 75 hours of battery life. When I initially started playing with this mouse, I thought it would be a bit better fit for me if they just came in like a medium version. It just so happens that PMM makes a model that's the same shape, but 10% larger. This is an older version. They've moved to split triggers now and a solid shell if you prefer. Unfortunately for me, the magic I get with the smaller shape just doesn't translate to this larger shape. I don't know if it's because the front height is three millimeters higher or because the rear hump holds my wrist at a slightly different position. It just doesn't hit for me in the larger size. The coating here isn't my favorite. It doesn't bother me on the sides, but the triggers have a tendency to get slippery, something that could easily be fixed with some grips, but unfortunately there's none included here. There's a reason why I saved this mouse for last, and that's because I consistently hit higher aim trainer scores and play better in game with this mouse than anything else I own. The Viper V2 Pro on the 4K dongle is a close second, but the results are consistent enough that this is the undisputed top performer for me. As such, this gets my nod for the 2022 FPS Mouse of the Year and recipient of the highly coveted Golden Beard Award. It's also a testament to the idea that shape is still the most important factor, even over bleeding edge wireless technology. And yes, I have spent some time with the M8, and while it does have the lowest front height of all time, I just can't find a grip that doesn't cause me wrist pain with this. Shape is a highly subjective thing, and unfortunately, this is just not one that works for me. Anything on this list today is easy to recommend with the understanding that the HSK is a very niche mouse and the MZ1 wireless might not be a shape that works immediately out of the box, but is worth learning in my opinion. Spending this kind of money, it would be totally understandable if you wanted to stick to places where you can just walk in and buy or return easily. And if that's the case, your best bet's probably to stick with Razer or Logitech. I really talk about the super light in videos because the shape just doesn't work for me, but I know that's an unpopular opinion and it remains a very safe recommendation. I would love to see something new from Logitech aside from recolors. The upcoming ROG and Aim Lab collab mouse, the Harp Ace, is another really solid pick. I just did a pretty detailed look at it in my last video. I'm hearing the price is coming in at $149.99. That's steep, but it performs really well. It's got a really unique shape and it's got some quality of life features and pretty top tier build quality that you wouldn't expect on a mouse that weighs only 54 grams. I did most of my testing for this video on the new Zowie XL 2566K, the 360 Hertz Diac version. Full review on that one very soon. Audio is either the SteelSeries Nova 7 Wireless or the Blessing 2 Dusk IEMs on the Zendak V2. 2023 is already shaping up to be a pretty exciting year for both mice and monitors. Zowie finally entered the wireless marketplace and that first outing didn't go exactly as planned. We've seen both an outburst reaction and a public walk back from them so far. Hopefully the next thing we see from Zowie is a more athletic approach to the mouse market because competition is ferocious right now. I do have the 1440p 360 hertz IPS panel from Asus here and we will be taking a look at the 240 hertz OLEDs just as soon as I can get my hands on them. The DAC amp video is still in the works as well. That's it for today. I will catch you all in the next one. Stay up.